We will now have a 20-minute position statement from Dr. Shochet. Let me mention that Dr. Shochet has the option of finishing a little early and transferring some of his time to his rebuttal period a little bit later. So if he does not use all the 20 minutes, that time will be transferred to his rebuttal period a little bit later on. So Dr. Shochet, your 20-minute position statement, sir. Before I start and the clock starts ticking, <clears throat> just uh, <clears throat> one comment. Uh, viewers' discussion advised, uh, meaning that since we all know this is a polemical debate, so obviously certain things will be said that may appear offensive to some, knowing nothing of that sort is intended. We have to just take things as they come and in context. So just want this to be realized. Where do I start this? Oh, that button here, okay. <clears throat> There are two basic issues to deal with. Number one, could Jesus be the Jewish Messiah promised in the Bible? Two, can one be a follower of both the Jewish faith and the Christian faith? Like a Hebrew Christian, Jewish Christian, Jews for Jesus, or whatever else they call themselves. The answers to both these questions are categorical no's. Why is it impossible for Jesus to be the Jewish Messiah? Mashiach, the Jewish Messiah, is a concept wholly and totally derived from and dependent on the Jewish Bible. For all and any information, one can depend only on the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible. To put it very briefly, there are ten basic aspects, read the biblical Mashiach and Messianic era. Number one, Mashiach is a descendant of King David. He says, obviously a human being. God has vouchsafed the divinely sanctioned rulership of the Jewish people, the throne of Israel, to David and his descendants forevermore. To be the legitimate successor to King David, therefore, Mashiach must be a direct descendant in paternal line, son after son, for the Torah restricts tribal affiliation and succession to paternal descendants only. Number two, of Mashiach it is said in Isaiah, the spirit of God will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and might, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of God. He shall be inspired with fear of God. Number three, Mashiach will come after the children of Israel will sit solitary for many days without king and without prince and without sacrifice, Hosea chapter three. Number four, the holy temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt to stand forevermore after Mashiach comes, as explained in the book of Ezekiel. Number five, the exiles of Israel will be restored from all the corners of the world to the holy land, the land of Israel as explained in numerous passages in the five books of Moses and practically every prophet. This restoration of Israel is unconditional and will happen even if the people should not wish to return, as explained in Ezekiel. Number six, the whole earth, once Mashiach comes, will be filled with awareness, consciousness, knowledge, and perception of God and godliness. God's spirit will be upon his people, endowing them all with the power of prophecy and vision. All mankind will worship God in unison. I leave out all the references. If necessary, I'll quote them later on simply to save time. Number seven, oh sorry, a part of number six also includes that the messianic era will be an end to evil and sin. Seven, the Messiah will usher in a permanent era of universal peace and harmony, a veritable utopia throughout the world. Isaiah chapter two, Isaiah chapter two, Micah chapter four, Zechariah chapter nine. Even the animal kingdom will be affected to the point that animals too will live in peace and harmony with one another. Number eight, the messianic year will witness the eradication of disease and all afflicted shall be healed, Isaiah 35. Death itself too shall cease, Isaiah 25. Number nine, in the final stage of the messianic era, there will be a resurrection of the dead. Number 10, there will be marvelous prosperity with an abundance of every kind of produce. Now, not a single one, not one, of these prophecies applies to Jesus, both according to the well-known Jewish tradition, which rejects Jesus categorically, as well as according to the admission of the New Testament. Four, number one, according to the New Testament, he was not a paternal descendant of David. And in Judaism, as said, it is only the father who determines tribal affiliation and succession. The mother determines the religion, the faith of the child, but not the tribal affiliation, as stated explicitly in Numbers. Number two, he did not come after Israel was without sacrifices, a holy temple, exiled to all corners of the world. 
Number three, the earth has certainly not been filled with the knowledge and perception of God since he came. Nor does all mankind worship God in unison, nor is there an end to evil and sin and warfare, nor is there universal peace and harmony among men and animals on the eradication of disease and the resurrection of the dead. In fact, the world has never seen so much warfare, bloodshed, suffering, confusion, inhumanity, etc., as since the coming of Jesus, and very much, if not most, unfortunately, in his name. The idea of a second coming is a sheer invention without any source whatsoever, and contradicts even the words of Jesus himself, who promised that the messianic age and redemption would be in his generation. Matthew, uh, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. This generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Uh, little wonder then that his last words on the cross, according to John, uh, was were words of disappointment and resignation when he said, it is finished. And bowed his head and gave up his spirit. According to Matthew 3, John the Baptist made the same prediction. And it's also found in Revelation, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. The time is at hand. So obviously, it was not meant even by the New Testament in terms of a second coming. Number four, Moshiach is supposed to be a man with the spirit of God upon him, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of God. He shall be inspired with fear of God. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. Unfortunately, Jesus did not live up to this, as according to the records of the New Testament and Jewish records, he was a contentious and witting transgressor and denier of God's laws and commandments and Jewish tradition. To wit, A, he condoned the capital offense of his disciples, violating the Sabbath as recorded in Matthew chapter 12, and in fact publicly violated the Sabbath himself on several occasions, as recorded in Matthew chapter 12, Luke chapter 13, and Luke chapter 14. B, he denied and mocked the dietary laws of the Torah, as recorded in Matthew chapter 15 and Mark chapter 7. C, he violated and mocked the need for ritual washing of the hands, as recorded in Matthew chapter 15, Mark chapter 7, Luke chapter 11. D, he ignored the practice and laws of ordained fasts, as recorded in Matthew chapter 6, Mark chapter 2, Luke chapter 6. E, he opposed and mocked communal prayers, as recorded in Matthew chapter 6. F, he violated and mocked the Ten Commandments precept of honoring one's mother and father, as recorded in Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 23, Luke chapter 14. G, he denied the biblical permission to divorce, as recorded in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 19. H, he violated the biblical prohibition against carrying a grudge and revenging yourself by cursing, threatening, and planning revenge against those who would not believe and follow him, as recorded in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 19, and the first book of Corinthians chapter 16. And if necessary, I'll quote you these passages uh, where this is recorded explicitly. I, on the one hand, he pretended to affirm and strengthen the rabbinic ordinances of the Pharisees, as recorded in Matthew chapter 5 and Luke chapter 23, and then turned around to warn his followers to beware of the teaching of the Pharisees, Matthew chapter 16. In short, we are presented with the picture of a man who violated the eternal commands of God as ordained in the Bible, sometimes using indefensible and immoral sophistry that others did or would commit the same violations, arguing in effect that two wrongs make it right or irrational and other this type of arguments to justify himself. I'm not even going to touch upon the presumptuousness of arrogating to himself the power to stand above the law, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, make or break laws and commandments at will, forgive sins committed against God, or apparent blasphemies. All this is a very, very far cry from one inspired by and filled with the spirit of the fear of God. Jesus' behavior thus violated the explicit commandments of the Bible which state, A, Deuteron Deuteronomy 4.2, do not add to the word that I command you and do not subtract from it. And again in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, do not add to it and do not subtract from it, which is followed incidentally by the warning about false prophets leading Israel astray. And B, Deuteronomy chapter 17, 8, 12, to turn to the priests or the judge at the time for all religious disputes and then 
And I quote, do as they tell you, follow all they instruct you, do not stray to the right or left from the word that they declare to you, which is the biblical source for the authority of the rabbis or Pharisees, whose instructions must be followed, and as Jesus himself suggests and recommends and demands of his followers in some parts. Conclusion. Jesus did not live up to a single criterion of Mashiach, the Messiah discussed in the prophecies of the Jewish prophets addressed and promised to the Jewish people and recorded in the Jewish Bible. As for the second issue, whether a Jew can remain a member of the Jewish faith and also believe in Jesus and the New Testament. The biblical passages from Deuteronomy just cited, forbidding any changes in the Jewish Bible, adding or subtracting, let alone accepting someone as a prophet or more who himself violated the biblical precepts, already answers this question with a categorical no. Moreover, Deuteronomy 4.35 states, you were shown the revelation of God at Sinai in order that you may know that the Lord is the God and there is none beside him. None of the same word can also mean nothing beside him. Again, Deuteronomy 439, you are to know this day and take to your heart that the Lord is the God in the heaven above and on the earth below, there is none other. This clearly forbids ascribing any divinity or authority to anyone or anything besides God, lest one be guilty of idolatry. Moreover, just as only American authorities can determine American citizenship and only French authorities can determine French citizenship, so only Jewish traditional authorities, the unbroken chain of the authorities of the Jewish faith, meaning the Pharisees or rabbis, can determine membership in the Jewish faith. There is no need to mention that these Jewish authorities have determined that one cannot be a member of the Jewish faith while also accepting Jesus or Muhammad or Buddha or Krishna or Zoroaster. Indeed, even the New Testament recognizes this fact and rejects the idea of retaining Jewish religious identity and Christianity. According to the New Testament, the Israel of old has been superseded by the new Israel, the new Jews, the new seed of Abraham, which are all the believers in Jesus. And I quote, For he is not a Jew who is one on the outside, nor a circumcision that which is on the outside in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one on the inside, and circumcision is that of the heart in spirit and not by the written code. Romans. Not all out of Israel are Israel, neither because they are Abraham's seed are they all children. The children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as a seed. Again, Romans. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. Those who are of faith, these are the sons of Abraham. As many as are of the works of the law, Jews, observing the Torah, are under a curse. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus. If you are of Christ, you are really Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Now in Jesus became near, for he made the both one, meaning Jew and Gentile, and broke down the wall of partition, that he might create the two into one new man, in one body, through the stake. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, freeman, and so forth. Then you have a typical diatribe of Paul, anti-Semitic I call it, where he starts denying even that the Jewish people are the true children of Abraham, the true heirs of Abraham. And he writes the following, these are the two, this incidentally from Galatians chapter 4, these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which brings forth children for bondage, and which is Hagar, the bondmaid of Abraham. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, corresponding with the Jerusalem of today, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem which is above is free, and is the mother of us all. We, brothers, as Isaac was, are children belonging to the promise. Just as the, then the one born in the man of the flesh persecuted the one according to the spirit, meaning the son of Hagar persecuted Isaac, so also now. Nevertheless, what the scriptures say, throw out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brothers, we are not children of the bondwoman of the free, meaning, in other words, that Jews are no longer, are not Jews, are not the rightful descendants of Abraham, but those who believe in Jesus are. The very idea of Hebrew Christians as a Jews for Jesus, who would retain some Jewish religious identity, therefore, stands in direct contradiction contradiction to both Judaism as well as the New Testament. Indeed, the New Testament goes so far as to say that real Jews have nothing to gain from accepting Jesus. If you are circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. 
I bear witness to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Galatians chapter 5. So if you had the misfortune that at eight days old you are circumcised, forget about Jesus. He's not going to help you anything. Moreover, if you're circumcised, like I just quoted, Christ shall fail you nothing. If righteousness is through the law, Christ really died for nothing. This man can no longer be righteous through the law. Though those who adhere to the law are heirs, the faith has been made void and the promise ineffective because the law produces wrath. For all those as are of the works of the law are under a curse. Moreover, listen carefully. The law is not made, meaning the Torah, the laws, the commandments of the Bible, God's eternal commandments. The law is not made for the righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslavers, for fornicators, for men who lie with males, for kidnappers, for liars, for those who swear falsely, and any other thing that is contrary to sound teaching according to the glorious gospel, which was committed to my trust. First book of Timothy, chapter 1. Thus, even by New Testament standards, it makes no sense to speak of Jewish Christians, Hebrew Christians, Jews for Jesus, or whatever they like to call themselves now, Messianic Jews. These groups pretending to be Jewish and trying to fool themselves and others by observing certain Jewish laws, customs, and practices, thus violate the New Testament passages, which I just quoted, which declare categorically that, as said, that if righteousness is through the commandments, through the observance of Jewish customs and practices, Christ really died for nothing. The execution of Jesus is the end of the law. It's follows then that not only from Jewish tradition, but even according to the straightforward teaching of the New Testament, without interpreting, just reading what it says, not taking out of context, just the words as they are, the concept of Jewish Christians, Messianic Jews, Jews for Jesus, etc., makes as much sense as square circles, Jews for Zoroaster, kosher pigs, Christian Muslims, Christians for Krishna, and all other such oxymorons. Thank you.